not or not i hope uh we are well fed enough to take us across to the last stretch of our today workshop before we close um just one uh, um house uh, just an announcement um i do understand that there are there are a couple of um a few vegetarians and a few pescatarians in the room so if you have any dietary um needs for our day tomorrow for lunch tomorrow please let me know i have ordered four uh, uh vegetarians and four fish for those who are pescatarians for tomorrow they are i mean of course if um if there are leftovers others can eat it but um but i've just ordered it just in case um um anyone needs uh we 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 haven't accounted for any vegetarians or any other pescatarians so if if you have any dietary needs for tomorrow let me know and we can arrange for your for for special meals to be prepared i um without further ado i am going to hand over to our moderator for the last session uh, mr kenroy roach to take us through a uh, board session. Mr. Roach, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, welcome back uh, for the final session for today. Um, I hope everyone had a good lunch and we were energized. I think you're in for quite a treat um, with this session. Um, so my name is uh, Ken Roy Roach. Um, the, as you know already, I'm the head of the UN Resident Coordinator's Office for Barbados and Eastern Caribbean. Uh, this session is um, session four, Strengthening National uh, Focal Points uh, Partnerships. So we're going to focus heavily on, on partnerships, which you know already has been highlighted in the ABAS, and we've been referring to it in the discussions uh, yesterday and today as an important element for delivering on the ABAS. Um, I'm delighted to moderate this session where we will delve into the critical aspects of the ABAS and um, how to develop, as I said, those partnerships. Um, partnerships offer the opportunity to bridge sectors, harness diverse expertise, and mobilize resources to achieve shared goals. Um, the session will focus on how national focal points can forge stronger partnerships across government, civil society, the private sector, academia, international development partners, the media, and many others. So we'll hear from an esteemed panel who have successfully navigated these partnerships and who will share valuable insights on how we can turn partnerships and recommendations from these partnerships into actionable initiatives. I think I wanted to say um, at the get-go from my perspective, as we look into the uh, full implementation of the ABAS, it's important to connect the notion of partnerships with a discussion on the means of implementation. And I think already from the conversations we've had uh, that really I think eliminated, uh, il illuminated, sorry, the need for focusing on how to help SIDS deal with the capacity challenges. Definitely, um, we should be thinking about how partnerships can bring those um, inputs or those means, uh, the means for implementation. And as you know well already, um, some of those include um, partnerships for institutional building and capacity development ensuring that there is institutional quality, which we know is important. Um, partnerships for strengthening uh, national statistical systems to ensure that robust monitoring evaluation frameworks are in place at a national level um, to inform decision-making. Uh, partnerships for uh, technology transfer and digital transformation, ensuring that both the private sector and the public sector acquire digital and technological tools necessary to leapfrog their productive systems and advance the digital transformation agenda and partnerships for financing to deliver 
on on those 10 core areas of, of the ABAS. So those are just some, but I'm sure the panel will be exploring those and other means and other mechanisms and ways of de delivering on partnerships. So they will dig deeper and share how their work are already contributing to building durable symbiotic partnerships for SIDS. We'll explore best practices for building capacity and communicating the impact of our efforts to stakeholders. I look forward to a fruitful discussion, as I'm sure you do, and hearing your ideas on how we can all work together to foster partnerships with and for national focal points that will turn support um, implement that will in turn support the implementation of the ABAS and create lasting positive changes for um, small island states. So let me introduce um, the panelists. We have this afternoon uh, Ms. Rebecca Fabrizzi, who you've met already, special envoy for to my immediate left. Special Envoy for SIDS of the United Kingdom. Uh, to Rebecca's left, uh, Ms. Gabriela Casola, Ministry for Foreign Affairs and European Affairs and Trade of Malta. Uh, to my right, um, Mili Ojden, founder and CEO. Mili, where is Mili? I don't see. She, we know she's wrong, but she'll join this panel. Uh, founder and CEO of TreeLink Vanuatu. Trade Commissioner to California, um, Sasha Jettinsain, a loss and damage expert with Climate Analytics, uh, Ms. Juliet Hawker, Hawkwa, sorry, I don't see Juliet, oh, Juliet is there, yes, Juliet, who we also know very well, um, head of the Monitoring and Evaluation Unit of the Office of the Prime Minister of Vanuatu and Na National Focal Point. And of course, Damien Sass, who is the Sustainable Development Officer at UNOHR LLS. So those are the panelists this afternoon. Uh, we will start with the panelists, giving uh, five minutes to each panelist for their intervention. And with further um, ado, I'll hand over to Rebecca. Thanks very much, Kamoy. It's gonna take me between five and 10 minutes. Okay, I'm just warning you. <laughs> Um, so I'm kind of like the NFP for SIDS in the UK government. I think we're a bit unusual amongst big donors in having this role, but I think it's great and I hope it'll be um, a trend. Um, if for us, it illustrates the fact our government decided a few years ago to prioritise SIDS as a special case for development, recognising the particular vulnerability that we all know all about. And that's supported by particular interests from our government in many SIDS countries as Commonwealth members. And I mention that because, um, of course, many of us will be um, next week in summer, um, which including I'm going and Gabriel, um, and some more famous people like the King and Queen of England. <laughs> and our Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary will be there too. And I probably worth mentioning as well that our new Foreign Secretary because um, we have a new government and he has family and friends all over the Caribbean, so is very well sensitised to SIDS issues himself. Um, with a new government, our previous strategy for SIDS is sort of mothballed, but um, it's probably worth being, giving a little bit of context. We'll be renewing it um, and we're going to take advantage of our ministers having been properly exposed to SIDS concerns, so at Chogham and COP and with some bilateral visits. So our Commonwealth Minister went to Seychelles last week and um, our Latin America and Caribbean minister is in Jamaica right now, and she's going to the Bahamas this week as well. So um, they're getting a very good um, exposure to SIDS and all of the things that we've been talking about. Um, so our work has been organized around advocacy for SIDS. So in our own system and in international systems where the UK has got a useful platform and with other donors who don't necessarily share the same view of the priority, um, and then policy initiatives, we had a landmark call for action on access to finance at COP26, um, principles for effective development impact in SIDS, and we don't make up policy for SIDS, so these were partnership projects with AOSIS and SIDS governments and other donors as well, so strong examples there of partnership, and then also we do programming with grant finance to support SIDS development, and it's complemented by other activities in our government benefiting SIDS, 
So most notable is probably work on reform of development finance systems, disaster risk financing and disaster risk reduction, work on ocean biodiversity and climate finance and net zero. Um, a recent strong example, I think, of partnership is our DAXIDS partnership that we launched successfully at SIDS4 um, with Samara and Antigua and Barbuda. Um, I'm sure that you'll know that the DAC um, Development Assistance Committee governs rules around ODA and gives non-binding guidance on development to members of the committee. And we were concerned there that the DAC's approach to SIDS was quite conservative, not necessarily taking real account of SIDS context. And so we promoted the partnership as a way to make the DAC approach better informed. So we're now discussing how to take forward implementation, but without creating new bureaucratic burden. And this is an aim to improve focus by donors on SIDS priorities and to improve the impact of development. Um, so that's just a sort of brief overview of things that we've been doing just in context. Um, partnerships are essential for the delivery of every part of our work. So I'm gonna give a few more examples and ideas including thoughts for our role in implementing um, the ABAS. So first, I think it's important just to mention with um, the national focal points that we have a very big diplomatic footprint in SIDS. So we've got 12 diplomatic missions in the Caribbean. Um, I think we have seven in Pacific Island countries and also in Mauritius, Seychelles and Maldives as well. And I just mentioned them because um, you probably know them already, but their job is to work with you, with your governments, understand your priorities, and they're your port of call for UK support. So uh, some of them are quite big, you know, in Barbados, it's quite large, but some of them are very small. But they, even if they're very small, they know how to connect back into our system and to, um, to help you articulate your requests and interest in working with us as well. Um, We've got quite a vast array of development programming, but I'm just going to mention a couple of things. So um, one thing that we've been working on is pilot programs on access to climate finance, which was another initiative that came out of COP26. And with this, we've got embedded climate finance advisors across certain governments, including in Fiji, um, Mauritius and Jamaica. Um, so earlier this year, uh, we were also thinking about what we were going to do with our um, program on building climate resilient infrastructure in the Caribbean, which is a program that's been going for about nine years now across about um, eight Caribbean countries um, to build sort of climate resilient um, roads and ports and so on. Um, and this will wind up quite soon. We wanted to work on a plan to renew the program. Um, so we decided to, to sort of develop a program to use learning from the pilot program on access to climate finance that's happening in Jamaica to come up with a new kind of system. So a sort of collaborative activity with the government of Jamaica and with climate funds, but with an aim to create a new kind of platform where we will use grant financing to eliminate barriers and reduce risks and enable private investments so that we can use our grant funding to leverage many multiples of um, private investment in to build a lot more climate resilient infrastructure. Um, so our funding announcement for this was 200 million pounds. And the idea is it should create many more multiples of that and hopefully be an effective model, um, which would, it, this will be in the Caribbean, but hopefully it will be an effective model that could be deployed elsewhere. So I was quite interested actually, I think it was Juliet earlier saying that it can sound quite boring to sort of create a new system. And it's true that, you know, if you ask ministers if you can have 200 million pounds but they won't get a road to open or, or a new bridge like you know that they've built to look at it can be quite difficult to sell that idea but anyway we managed that in the end um we've got dedicated programming for sids um which is through two programs which offer technical assistance for capacity building active in in many of the countries here so we've got um one is dedicated to marine economies and one is more general so an example there, here in Vanuatu and in six other Pacific Island countries, we've embedded climate finance advisors and governments to help with capacity support to access funds like the GCF. So that's a kind of triangular partnership arrangement with local governments and with um, GGGI who implement the project for us. Um, other important partnerships, for example, um, working with government of Barbados on global financial systems reform and our prime minister announced at UNGA that we will join the four Ps. Um, and we deliver regional assistance through regional organizations um, all across the SIDS regions, like through five Cs or CARTAC, PIFTAC, SPREP, um, regional development banks, GEF, Special Climate Change Fund, GCF, and so on. 
and also these partnerships with academia that um, Ken Roy mentioned are important and Resi for us is a really important partner so um, we fund a lot of the work that Resi does as well and of course the UN as well so it's sort of been our pleasure to um, to be big contributors to some of the UN activities for SIDS recently. Um, I mentioned yesterday it's important that SIDS don't just think of donors like the UK as being bilateral sources of funding, but also as change agents who can support and promote your objectives in organisations that matter, whether it's UN, World Bank, the DAC, <clears throat> and so on. Because we also we have our role there and our platform there, which is slightly different from yours, but where our interests align, then we can also work to support um, what you are your objectives too. Um, a second second last point, so I'm nearly at the end, but um, we're really interested in making better use of the expertise that we have. So um, there's a high concentration of financial institutions, um, insurance industry, um, tech companies, tech innovation, and so on in the UK. Um, we want to work better with these um, these actors. So that was really what I was referring to earlier when I said that we are looking for ideas. So I didn't really mean so much we're looking to understand the problems, but more to be creative with solutions um, and think more about ways, you know, how we can actually deliver effectively um, finding solutions to the problems that have been identified um, in the AVAS. And then just finally, I want to mention that our new government um, is very vocal in support of issues which are important to SIDS. So net zero, climate action, nature and biodiversity protection, um, solidarity with developing countries and working in partnership for meaningful solutions. So, you know, if you're unsure of the commitment, if you're interested, please do look at our Prime Minister's statement at UNGA, which sets out that in more detail. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. And uh, yes, I mean, from where I sit in Barbados, uh, we see very strongly UK's um, participation, for example, in the Eastern Caribbean Development Partners Group and the UK SIF and the, the, the access to the infrastructure fund um, across across the Caribbean. Um, so thank you for, for raising those important points. Um, next, um, I would like to go to uh, Gabriella. Uh, from the uh, Malta Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Kenroy. I'm supposed to have a presentation. In the meantime, please allow me, since this is my first intervention, to thank the government of Vanuatu for the excellent and formidable hospitality. Uh, just a small intro, I hail from the island of Malta. I am from the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, so I'm a capital-based expert covering SIDS unit. It's a very recently formed unit. Um, until a few years ago, it was even smaller than it is at the moment. So we've come a long way in spite of that. Um, by way of an introduction, um, I plan to go over these points more or less. We are a bit of an unusual case um, for different reasons than Rebecca just before me highlighted, and I'll be giving you some more context. First of which, our size. The writing on the map actually covers the size of the island itself, so that already gives you an idea of how small we are. Um, we are, uh, we were a SID, we were part of the group of SIDS just up until our membership into the EU in 2004. So um, so obviously that then put us into a whole new in, into a whole new perspective. Um, Malta was also one of the co-founders of EOSIS. It has piloted a lot of initiatives um, favoring SIDS, including um, the, the probably the most famous is UNCLOS. It was a Maltese diplomats initiative to, uh, to spell out uh, the ocean as being the common heritage of all mankind. So we've always had a very big affinity for all things SIDS. Population, 500, just north of half a million, 316 square kilometers, probably most of the SIDS in this room are actually bigger than Malta. And we have an last, last figures were 3 million tourists in 2023. So just gives you some perspective. This is where it all started, Chogham 2015. 
Um, as some of you may have noticed at the beginning of my presentation, there was another logo besides the one of the ministry, and that is the Small State Center of Excellence. And I know we've been hearing a lot about centers of excellence. Uh, this was another one which has which which came out of uh, the 2015 Chogam, and which was held in Malta. And uh, the idea was to have this center actually um, actually working for SIDS by small island states, because we consider ourselves to be small island states. This was a bit um, the initial uh, blueprint of what we used to do. I would say used to do because later on in the presentation, I will also go a bit over how this has a bit changed with time. Um, uh, sourcing of knowledge, providing human and institutional capacity, especially in the cases of islands similar to us, where most of the time it's extremely expensive to source knowledge for just that country. So our idea was always to group as many states, collect the needs and try and source the knowledge and put it at the service of small island developing states and small island states. And also to act as a voice for small states, which obviously is very synonymous as well with, uh, with the ministry I represent. The, this was, I think, one of the departure points, obviously, for most of us, um, Agenda 2030, but more importantly, I think, SDG 17, because it pretty much sums up all we've been talking about for the past two days. Policy and partnerships came very much together. I think probably differently to most, from what I've heard from most countries, um, we did not have a document to start off with. That came along afterwards. And our initial collaborations were with different entities. Some were, um, you know, just organic. Some came along as a result of requests. And this is more or less what we did. These are the topics we covered. Climate finance, SDG implementation, oceanography, um, data negotiations for small island states on sea level rise. And this is a snapshot of the various things that we did, including, I know some of you in the room had been to Malta, in fact, for one of these uh, conferences we organized, including on climate finance. Um, we also managed to facilitate um, some big initiatives in, within the local context on uh, meeting both counterparts from Africa, but also having and hosting participants from Caribbean and the Pacific um, in Malta for technical assistance. So basically it was like a residential seven day program, full blast on training on open source data. Data which uh, the knowledge and accessing would have been otherwise more difficult to get had we not had kind of created uh, an economy of scale within, within that system. Then this happened. And that was a bit of a pivot. And this was Chogim, um, not Chogim, sorry. This was COVID. <laughs> Both starting with a C in all fairness. <laughs> and this happened exactly in that year. Malta was, uh, we had at that at that point in time, uh, there was also a change as happens with, with most PRs. You have a change every few years. And uh, we found ourselves being coaches together with Antigua and Bermuda on the partnerships for small island developing states. So then the head scratcher began. Where do we start from? In a time of COVID, where no in-person activities were being held. So it was a bit of a pivotal moment for us in how we were reimagining things and doing things. I do apologize for the horrible formatting. It did not look that bad on my on my <laughs> on my um, on my computer. So um, these are the uh, four webinars we did. We did them together with um, agencies, organizations across all the regions in SIDS, and they varied from anything between COVID. This was done. I remember in the first few months. Um, COVID-19 across the board, um, SIDS and tourism and the impact obviously in a post, in a, you know, in that right in the period of, of COVID, partnerships within the blue economy, as well as uh, um, partnerships for SIDS in terms of renewable energy sources and water management. 
then uh you know a bit emboldened as well i suppose by 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 that exercise we also started working a bit more organically within the Maltese context. And this is where a bit the multi-stakeholder partnership started to really kick in. Um, and we teamed up with the University of Malta and the Islands and Small States Institute. And we started working on a SID scholarship program, um, which has been running for us now, I think, I believe in the second cycle. And this is specifically for post-grad studies. Um, most of the graduates from this program end up then heading climate change delegations to COP in the various countries or as being, um, you know, diplomats in, in whatever capacity. So um, this is something that we we feel as a small island state, this is something that we can contribute um, and something which is also meaningful. Also, very proudly, uh, last year, we were also awarded the SITS Partnership Award, thanks to this program. And uh, it was it was a nice recognition to get from a, from a UN uh, perspective. Policy and partnerships now look slightly different to what they looked for, looked like before. And uh, um, in the middle of it, um, the foreign policy strategy has been revised and I, I believe it's undergoing a revision as we speak. And there are actually um, also tangible uh, deliverables on to, um, to which we have to respond as, SIDS, as a SIDS unit from, from capital. Uh, we are working with a number of partners, including Commonwealth, um, University of Malta. We also uh, act as a bridge vis-a-vis -vis the European Commission. We work with EOSIS and we also work with OACPS. And these are all now partnerships that have been running into a number of years. Activities now look, again, a bit different. We've done, we've hosted a number of side events, including one at SITS4. Um, we've uh, also, we are currently on the UNS, uh, UN Security Council, and one of the signature events during Malta's rotating month was, uh, was an open debate on sea level rise in New York. Uh, we are also currently working on the Climate Vulnerability and Resilience Index. Um, we have spoken extensively about this in various international fora, including upcoming in COP. And I'll use this as a promo <laughs> for any of uh, any of the countries heading towards Chogem. We are holding a side event at Chogem on uh, future-proofing small states and looking a bit at what has been done, but also looking forward. And as my colleague from Mauritius very rightly said this morning, um, since there are also so many centers and there are so many niches of excellence, the idea is we want to synergize. We do not intend reinventing the wheel. We know what it costs to do something from scratch. So instead, let's partner together. We um, we have certain areas and certain niches and certain data that we would like to um, team up with, for example, with Antigua and Barbuda Global Data Hub. And I know there have been conversations in that direction. And we hope the same thing with Mauritius, for example, with the Climate Finance Access Hub. And where there are pockets of excellence, I think, as small island states, there needs to be more of this conversation of not reinventing the wheel, but working with what we have and synergizing. This is the agenda, in fact, for the um, Samoa 2024 side event happening on the 23rd of October. We've already have some uh, very high level uh, participation. We are also awaiting some other confirmations, which capital is chasing as we speak. And we hope to look forward and we look forward to also seeing some of your delegations over there. So to sum it up, what do we do differently? We have constant communication with our outposts, especially being a small uh, diplomatic service ourselves. We do not have representation in all the regions. So then we use the, the posts, the outposts, such as um, the Kingdom of Belgium, New York, um, Canberra, London, and we try and maximize this. Uh, we have worked and learned a lot from the capacity building we did, but also on what we are working for in the future and how that perhaps sometimes it's not only about capacity building, but it's about also furthering that capacity that is already in situ. Um, acting as a voice for small states, and this has stayed, I think, um, constant throughout, and acting as a bridge between SIDS vis-a-vis -vis the EU and the Commonwealth. 
and especially with the EU, um, I, we found that this was also something which was very missing. In fact, soon after we have had some important conversations even in London to which an invite to all seats was held. Um, shortly after the EU was appointed an EU envoy for seats, which was also very, I think, um, good and positive because it was there wasn't just the envoy before that. Uh, yes, <laughs> they may have, yes. <laughs> and these are my contacts. I'm very happy to, to exchange further information or answer any questions accordingly. Thank you. Can I just, I forgot to plug our side event. So on Thursday, on Thursday next week, Finance and Investment for Resilient Growth, Commonwealth Plan of Action at the Supreme Courtroom, Samoa Ministry of Justice and Courts Administration Courthouse, 8 a.m. on Thursday with free copy. Uh, thank you um, very much, uh, Gabriel and um, <laughs> Rebecca, for reminding us about the side event um, next week at Shogun. Um, and, you know, Gabriela, you mentioned the important role that Malta is playing as a voice for SIDS in the EU, and we really want to um, acknowledge and thank uh, Malta for that important role. And definitely the idea of how to link up the SID centers of excellence, I think is a very good one that you don't always have to start from scratch, right? There's a lot of good examples and experiences already. Um, I remember the colleague from Mauritius also mentioned the Aruba Center of Excellence, SID Center of Excellence. So certainly maybe one thing going forward is to see how we can connect all these various centers of excellence, even as we stand up the one in um, Antigua and Barbuda might be something to certainly look into. Um, let me then now welcome um, Mili Ojden, the founder and CEO of TreeLink, Vanuatu Trade Commissioner to California, um, uh, representing the voice of the private sector and really to give you um, the opportunity to bring your experience to some of the private sector. Thank you. Thank you and apologies for um being late. Um, I well, wear many hats in Vanuatu, um, but uh, today I'm speaking um, on behalf of the private sector, and I'll try my best to also elaborate uh, what I'm saying to apply to the Pacific SIDS, uh, if not also to the SIDS, uh, for, to all of us. Um, and uh, in terms of my uh, capacity as Vanuatu Trade Commissioner, I've worked on trade, uh, especially in the export uh, uh, arena, um, but I will speak about that towards the end. Um, uh, you see here, um, these are all pictures uh, from my work uh, in the rural and also in uh, how do I uh, induct the informal sector into the uh, uh, formal sector and uh, the digitization of um, the our population in Vanuatu, which most of them live in the rural, 80% of them live in the rural, and how do we um, gather them such that they can then uh, participate in um, all the things that we care about, in the statistics that we care about. So there are several um, stories here uh, that we start from um, a really grassroots level that I wish to share with you, so that way you have a better picture of the reality on the ground. Because I myself, uh, even though I've lived here uh, for, my family has been here for three generations, I will have to say, uh, I also have faults in how I perceive, um, you know, the necessity or infrastructure that is required for development. And I'm very happy to share that with you. So here we have a, a picture above of um, the uh, uh, civic society, uh, which was a partnership in which during COVID lockdown and uh, TC Herald, we had um, no capacity uh, for the women in the rural to have any kind of uh, avenue to make money. And so um, what we did is uh, all the, we had 41 uh, villages come together to compete for a VSAT for connectivity. And these women were competing not only for themselves, but also for the generation, for their kids to have access to information and participate in the global economy. So it means so much for them. So 41 
villages came together in the West Coast Santo. And uh, a lot of these women actually need to also have uh, the ability and permission from their government, uh, from their chief to travel. So it is not difficult. And they took a one day boat ride from the north part of Santo to the south. That's one day, eight hours minimum. And that's just uh, on the banana boat coming down for this chance to compete in a weaving competition. And many of these women didn't even know how to weave. So there were different villages that have to share that skill with each other so that they could learn how to weave and learn these new skills. And so here we have um, the um, documentation of uh, the different villages and who is going to win the competition. So uh, two villages won, and I believe one of the photo that was circulated around is actually from that um, West Coast Santo village in which they were not only able to get a VSAT, which is really important, but also the energy to power that VSAT. So one of the things that I, I was really surprised at, just like the satellite operators who would automatically assume, oh, don't you need connectivity? Don't, doesn't everyone need it? Isn't it a basic need, a basic requirement? But one thing that the VSATs, um, the operators don't have uh, the capacity to kind of extend um, uh, their work is actually in the energy sector as well. So in the digitization, in what we need for the connectivity to fulfill the ABS requirement is actually also electrification of the area in which we need to be able to then collect this kind of data. So next, I will go to um, this uh, port that we have. Um, and this is in Port Vila and also in, um, uh, in Santo, we have a port as well. And so what has been really successful for Vanuatu is that we have been able to um, uh, utilize the UN's, uh, UN trade and development's uh, assistance um, technical assistance and also implementation of the single window with Asukuda, and also that extends to our revenue, um, uh, our customs uh, immigration with Midas as well. And uh, I'd also like to share that actually I was a UN Trade and Development um, 5G and Renewable Energy finalist. So I was really uh, glad that what we have to say for the Pacific SIDS is important enough for the um, global trade to uh, uh, recognize the innovation that comes from this region. And what that is important in this digitization is actually the, the ability to for us to maybe collectively agree that we want to maybe use a super app once we have that connectivity, we use, we invest in this super app to then allow the end user to be able to populate the data fields for us. Um, so one example is uh, the informal sector where we're able to get the woman in the rural uh, that, are, that are traditionally you know, um, farmers or micro entrepreneurs or in handicraft, how can they also record their sale, their sales, uh, but also get information about you know um, uh, logistics information, and then how can they also feed into uh, the revenue stream? So then they can then be more bankable, and also possibly be able to get insurance. Um, so that is uh, the, um, the the possibility of uh, the digitization uh, for our economy. We have a technology we can leapfrog on. We have talked about satellites. And so we have a different array of satellite. And I have to say, uh, coming from Lugonville and because of TC Herald that has motivated me to act and found a company, 3Link, I had to, in the last four years, with no background in telecommunication, become an expert for my community. Because if I don't do it, no one's going to take that connectivity to that last mile, especially to the girls that I want to be able to have access to that uh, internet search browser to do her homework. So in the satellite communication space, we actually have a lot of operators that can compete with each other and provide us with the best pricing. 
And as a region or as SIDS nation, we can even talk to these global operators. Um, there are many of them and that have different technology in different uh, altitude and realms, geosats, leosats. Um, and in doing so, um, I also wanted to say that um, an important component, not only of the connectivity component, but actually of uh, the weather that, that affects our climate. So one thing that really matters to us is how do we have a little bit more notice? How do we have a little bit more early warning on the extreme weather coming our way? And though we can depend on many of the facilities that already uh, is available, um, many of the regional um, SP, S, uh, SPC, for example, has a lot of uh, geospatial um, data that is available for us. Uh, but also we have a lot of clouds uh, during that time. So there's actually innovation that happens in which we, from our ground station, can also give information from under the cloud formation for the satellite providers to then have more accurate uh, weather prediction. So we can host um, also private weather stations that can also help us better monitor our um, ocean uh, that we have stewardship over. Um, I wanted to say that uh, in my um, in my uh, particip participation in the past two days, I have um, I learned so much, and I'm really inspired by the ambassador that asked a lot of really uh, poignant question uh, that says, "How do we implement?" And so um, I am being bold in my. Uh, next presentation to just give ideas, really knowledge base that I would like to share with you on uh, how I have thought about the connectivity issue um, for the youth, for the youth SIDS. And so for the Pacific um, youth, we had come up with a particular um, uh, model and we all agree that uh, connectivity is important uh, to our youth. Uh, so that they can participate in meaningful work, uh, possibly uh, have remote work, but also be ready um, in the web 3.0 in which their culture or their artistic talent can be tokenized. So we're talking about the future that doesn't exist now. Uh, but from my experience from the Silicon Valley, um, and also I would say um, the ability to scale uh, I feel that if we all hold that imagination and hold that objective, we can implement this. Um, so these are the kids in the West Coast Santo as well. Um, they don't have the ability to um, get books, let's say, after a cyclone comes through because all their, their uh, paper and books are uh, wet. Um, not only that, but their schools have no roof in which they're able to um, get together and learn again. So. Um, that is um, uh, one photo uh, that is, uh, I hope it serves as an inspiration. And uh, so this is a, um, just a brainstorming session of how I've put together a connectivity agenda for implementation. And uh, even though you look at the Pacific Ocean, you say, ah, oh, there are actually very little people around um, and there's really mostly ocean. But if you look at the cost to actually implement uh, something that is sustainable, um, it actually really adds up because we have 14 nations, 14 uh, Pacific SIDS nation, and each of them require um, connectivity in a number of schools. And if you add those number up for just the implementation in the number of years that's required, let's say um, now till five years from now and five years to 10 years from now, so we can do this in scale, um, and uh, uh, so these are just some rough numbers for us to kind of gauge what are we looking at in terms of cost to implement connectivity. And um, uh, here we have, of course, we're talking about schools, but you can substitute any of these particular sites as uh, uh, community centers, or you could also say these are uh, the decentralized area council in a particular country. So um, these particular sites can serve as multi-purpose uh, connectivity area for the community. 
And uh, one thing that the, uh, the SIDS youth also uh, really wanted uh, in the digital connectivity agenda is also to have capacity building. And um, here we have, uh, if we just build three connectivity uh, uh, hubs, or uh, I would say um, a data warehousing area, um, we can substitute those sites for that. And you can see that uh, the implementation would be the first three sites might be you know north, central, south area, and then you come back again in another um, you know th uh, five years, and then you implement more uh, capacity depending on how you adjust to the technology. Um, of course, uh, all the technology that we see today is has to be powered by renewable energy. So any time that you hear connectivity, a need for digitization, um, you would also have to require the energy input for that. Um, next, it is um, an example of uh, how partnerships uh, can work very well uh, in terms of implementing uh, connectivity uh, for very little money. Um, this is a project that I, um, I did in 2020 uh, during a COVID lockdown. And at that time, when I went into telecommunication, I had no idea that in the next four years, there will be four category five cyclones coming our way. So I'm really glad that we implemented this because believe it or not, these designed VSAT survived these category five cyclones, though the towers were down. So um, these, uh, there are about 500 of these sites, not all mine, uh, throughout Vanuatu. And those 500 sites were so critical for that community to uh, bounce back from recovery, uh, but also um, to help NDMO be able to fulfill um, their uh, rapid recovery. And um, uh, this is important in the digitization. I'll come back to um, how these hubs could be multi-use for what we need with um, a bus. So here we have um, also um, Santo Sunset Environment Network. It is an indigenous a civic society NGO. Um, and they um, it's, it's quite special in the mountainous area of Santo where we have really rich biodiversity and birds that are not found anywhere else in the world. So these are really precious to us, not only to us, but for the for humanity, for humankind. And so in that capacity, um, since we play a very important role in uh, being able to provide very, very rich uh, carbon credit uh, in the ecosystem. And, um, and this, is, this is an example of how this partnership with uh, digital connectivity uh, plus a local indigenous uh, uh, civic society and a local operator uh, can really make a difference and push forward the agenda that we are all talking about today. Next, I'd like to talk about, um, this is my last slide, it's um, about um, data. Um, how do we proceed forward with data? Um, because data is very particular in how we, we agree on what fields we use and what are the uh, parameters. So maybe we today uh, agree that we need to move forward with one uh, group or sector of data. Maybe it's climate data. Or what what kind of environmental data that we believe it's uh, it's shared um, a property for for humanity or for our region um, that we can proceed forward and uh, because that would really help us create a baseline. So when there is a cyclone that comes through, do we have the baseline of what existed? Uh, what was our GDP prior to the cyclone? What was the biodiversity? Um, before the cyclone. What, how about the corals? How do they look like prior to that? So once we have that baseline, then we could actually measure the loss that took place. And uh, I, I would say that this is urgent uh, for our climate justice um, parameters. And uh, it is where we really, um, I would say all of us, uh, really feel there's a dire need to uh, action, um, but we don't really know how to make the first step. So I um, suggest uh, from the private sector uh, that you do double up on the digital connectivity, the digital infrastructure, 
that then can activate all the other um, uh, uh, goals that we wish to achieve. And so in the next three years, uh, implementing that connectivity is not easy if we all agree that we are going to do it because there is, uh, I've mentioned earlier, a licensing issue uh, within the sector. So perhaps this is bold, perhaps we can have an a, a ABUS licensing for the connectivity agenda so that we can just have this particular sector where we say for the local ISP or big telcos, if you want to participate, here's your spectrum. Go ahead and bring us that 5G for that connectivity, that broadband, so that we could use it for Internet of Things, for autonomous data collection. So we can put it into, let's say, a rainforest, and then we could hear the species that are there before and after a cyclone, for example. Um, so um, we also, once we have connectivity, uh, then we also have a higher chance of being able to conquer the ocean uh, in the horizon. Uh, we have autonomous um, uh, autonomous um, uh, vessels, and we also have drones uh, that is within our um, ability to uh, train our youth really quickly to utilize. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Millie, and um, a lot of good examples of um, different kinds of partnerships, whether it's with civil society or working even with the, the, the public sector in terms of schools and improving in connectivity. And I really liked how you're connecting digitization as a what I was calling earlier an accelerator for other things. So I think an important um, practical case that could be looked at um, in terms of landing some of the uh, priorities in the in the ABAS. Um, so thank you very much for that. We'll move to the, in the interest of time, to the next um, presenter, um, and it's Juliet, um, our friend Juliet, who we know very well. <laughs> um, and Juliet, um, the floor is yours. I don't know, you'll, you'll speak from there or? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you, uh, Mr. Roach, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity once again to just share some insights from Vanuatu. And um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to be very brief, but I'm just going to focus my discussion on um, just partnerships with local stakeholders in country and, um, and how that can relate to ABAS and implementing, um, just based on some of the things that we've gone through in, um, in our activities. So I think, um, First of all, what I think is really interesting is when we're talking a lot about partnerships, it's it can be sometimes quite confusing um, and, and, and maybe a little bit convoluted because there's so many different ways and different levels that we discuss it. And so it's also really important to look at um, what levels of engagement are required and the scope and the context. So for myself as an NPF, um, I work for central government and I don't, I'm not speaking for other countries and other NPFs, but one of the things that we have faced challenges with is just actually um, working out appropriate ways of engaging with different stakeholders, um, actually determining what is the appropriateness at what level uh, and who do we consult with and on what types of activities. And so by saying that, um, you know, and I'm thinking of the ABAS, which is as national focal points, we're trying to translate something that is global, but it's also built on our aspirations and things that we want to see happening. It's also linked to other global agendas. And so it becomes quite interesting to work through those different layers. So when I think about some of the experiences we've had here with our um, how we have integrated the SDGs into our own National Sustainable Development Plan, I think that it's also really um, interesting and important to remember the kind of essence and, and how culture can play a really important role in, in those experiences and, and how you engage with people in appropriate manners. So for example, here in Vanuatu, our national plan um, has three central pillars, social environment and the economy, but the foundation of our plan is actually based on culture. And that's because when we did a very extensive um, 
stakeholder engagement program, which was six months. And we went to all of our six provinces and we um, spent time with many, many different types of stakeholders. The one resounding thing that they said was, we do not want to have a national plan that is built on something that is separate and foreign to our culture, to what we deem as our traditional knowledge, to how we manage our economy, to how we see society, whether that's through health or education, or whether that's through infrastructure, or even um, traditional economy. How does that play a part? How do you actually marry that with the formal economy? Because we have about 80% of our population still live in the rural. And so it was very interesting and also very important for that to also be brought into our national plan so that when we're thinking of all our 15 goals and how that fits in with the SDGs, but also how that fits in with the ABAS and the principles in there, you also have to take it back to what national plans say and what and how they're founded and and where they got their basis from. So it's really important to also think about that in terms of how you engage with people. So for us here, when we were talking after um, I came back from Antigua in May, we were talking about how would we actually uh, formulize the ABAS? Do we follow the same kind of process we use for the SDGs? Um, does it mean that we have to develop something new? Can we add on? Can we take off? Can we review? And, and how do we bring in our other stakeholders um, who've been part of the SDG process with us, who've been part of our NSD process with us? And the one thing that they said was, well, you know, let's try and go back to basics. How do we actually engage those cultural ways that we dialogue and we relate to people and we interact with people? And why can't we continue to do that with the Abbas and not look at it as something separate and new, but just kind of um, bring it into the same way that we're doing it and continue to refine our processes because um, a lot of us here are male people and, you know, the normal process is you have to try something and then review and take stock. And if that doesn't work, you go back and you refine it and you keep going. And I think that's the same of, of everything in life, really. Um, and I think the other thing too, uh, just building on some of the really great examples that have come from our other speakers and um, Millie is an example of that, like just so many um, existing stakeholder engagements and platforms that we already have in many of our countries. So I would just really like to encourage that we continue to build on that. And if we're not sure um, who's doing what and what areas, then really get out and talk to key people. I mean, there are agencies, we all know people, we partner with um, chambers of Commerce. We have a uh, fantastic um, Vanuatu Association of NGOs here, and our Secretary General for Van Gogh is there, Miss Shirley Abraham. So I'm really hoping that um, if there is time and the moderator allows during the Q&A that she's able to um, just share a few insights because we've had some really interesting success stories. And I would just like to touch on uh, one particular one here, Shirley, if you'll, if you'll let me. Um, and the government through our department um, recently supported Van Gogh with a CSO mapping project where they were able to um, go through all of the NGOs that are registered uh, here in Vanuatu and do a mapping exercise to determine where, where they are doing work around all our six provinces, but also mapping their activities to our NSDP goals and policy objectives. And so for us, I mean, I, I see that as a, as a plus and, and a really good story to share in terms of how we continue to learn from working through established partnerships, but also building on that because uh, Van Gogh have said that, look, we are doing, the reality is we're on the ground. We're doing a lot of that implementation of the NSDP and the SDGs, but we do need support and capacity in terms of how we map that. And so we can kind of uh, bridge those gaps and coordinate a bit better so that we're not doubling up. So if there's agencies that are on the ground working in a certain area where the government doesn't have a sub-center or there's no health center or no activities in that place, but there is an established CSO there, um, for us, we see that as a really great way of partnership and resource pooling and, and working together to implement things in a very simple way. But sometimes all you need is a map to kind of have a look at and say, oh, okay. So... Um, I think, um, yeah, those those are the key things that I really wanted to to point out today, and um, I look forward to more discussion. Thank you. Um, 
thank you, uh, Juliet, for that. And yes, we certainly look forward to hearing about uh, Van Gogh um, and the experiences uh, that Ms. Abraham will share with us. Hopefully we'll have some time in the, in the Q&A in terms of how to work with civil society organizations and how those organizations can actually help deliver services um, in places where it's not possible for government to reach. So that's a very important element in the construct of, of partnerships. Um, let's move next um, to Sasha Jatan Singh, uh, loss and damage expert from Climate Analytics, um, who will share some perspectives on partnerships. Hi, thank you, Ken Roy, and, and I'm so happy to, to be here um and to just listen to you know the perspectives and lessons and experiences from the private sector and from the government of Vanuatu um on partnerships with civil society and how how they've harnessed civil society to actually you know implement and do data collection and support um sustainable development priorities and um you're probably wondering <laughs> why you know, uh, um, just an organization that's called Climate Analytics. Why are they involved in sustainable development and the Abbas? And just a little bit about um, climate analytics. Um, so we're a global climate science and policy institute um, with offices around the world. And we're engaged in, you know, driving and supporting climate action aligned to the 1.5 degrees Celsius warming limits. So, you know, our focus is to connect science and policy to empower vulnerable countries in the international climate negotiations and inform national planning with targeted research analysis and support. And the Caribbean office, which is based in Trinidad and Tobago, is our newest office. And what we're doing is, you know, supporting Caribbean governments and translating, you know, the international climate agreements, international targets, policies, and governance arrangements. And at the same time, we're working with civil society, you know, across the Caribbean region and nationally within countries to, you know, increase awareness and understanding of climate change, of the climate change agreements, and also enabling, um, you know, civil society to play a greater role in participating in decision-making processes um, at, across all levels in terms of climate, climate change and climate action. And what we've noticed is that for Caribbean SIDS, and this is true for all SIDS, is that you cannot, you know, you can't separate building climate resilience from, you know, ensuring sustainable development. And I think that's, that's quite important. It keeps coming up all the time. And in, in the Caribbean, um, you know, we have a very strong civil society um, presence that's focused on climate action. But when you start talking to them about the work that they do, it's, it's really also focused on ensuring, um, you know, sustainable development co-benefits if it's related to supporting health in rural communities or energy access uh, or ensuring water and sanitation, right? But they think of themselves as a climate change NGO. So it's how do you bridge that gap? And that's why we realize that we have to to consider both climate action and sustainable development um, in the work that we're doing within um, the Caribbean region specifically. So, so that's just, you know, just in case and somebody was wondering why. <laughs> why is like, you know, a climate, climate institute involved in, in sustainable development, but for SIDS, we can't, you know, it, it's, you can't separate the, the work on both issues. Um, and I think it's it's actually a nice leeway into discussing the the CID civil society action plan and roadmap um for the next ten years, which was developed and launched at um at CIDS for earlier this year. And you know, just just to give a little context about why 
you know, it's important to situate so society as a key partner for sustainable development in studs. And, you know, the Samoa pathway really reaffirmed the importance of engaging a broad range of stakeholders at the global, regional, sub-regional, national, and local levels around sustainable development. And it's important to note that civil society has and, and brings important contributions, you know, holding governments and other other organizations accountable for their actions. Also, civil society is important in representing the needs of communities and vulnerable and marginalized groups. They're also involved in protecting ecosystems and also, and we've heard they provide services and directly implement projects to support sustainable development and resilience in SIDS. And we've heard examples already. And, you know, it, it's because of this, having a stronger civil society involvement will be strategic to drive public policy innovation, promote effective service delivery that leaves no one behind, as well as to ensure transparency, accountability, and citizen participation. And because of this, you know, this is why it was important to develop a, a civil society action plan and roadmap to, to support the implementation of the ABAS. And, um, you know, these are just, uh, you know, some of the civil society participants from the Caribbean region specifically who um, were involved in helping to develop this um this action plan and roadmap and just a bit about this um so a coordinating group of civil society across the three SIDS regions were convened between 2023 and 2024 to develop this action plan and roadmap with broad inputs from um, representatives from civil society across all SIDS region and in the Caribbean, um, the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, as well as the SIDS4 CSO coalition in Antigua and Barbuda, um, convened the you know the broad um, consultations and development of the plan. In um in the Pacific, uh, this was led by Piango, the Pacific Island Association of Non Governmental Organizations, and in the AIS region, um. This, this work was led by the SIDS Youth Ames Hub, as well as the Development Indian Ocean Network. So you see, we had conveners from across all three SIDS regions, and each in each region, these conveners really focused on, on getting inputs and um, and consult, consulting with, um, with CSOs there. And the outcome was, um, was, you know, this um, civil society action plan and roadmap. And at at um, SIDS4, there was a special event, a civil society forum, where um, the whole, the, the focus of this was to foster collaborative and inclusive approach, recognizing the unique contributions of civil society and driving the sustainable development agenda in SIDS. And it was here that the SIDS civil society action plan and roadmap was formally launched at um at SIDS4. And this is so I have the link for for the roadmap and action plan up. And um the the main purpose of this um action plan and roadmap is to provide a broad framework and concrete recommendations for action by SIDS civil society as well as action by SIDS governments and development partners to better enable and support civil society to deliver a participatory, multi-sectoral, and whole of society approach to sustainable development in, SID, in SIDS. So it's really, this is what CSOs in SIDS want um, for, for you know, their countries, how sustainable development should look how can they support the Abbas and how can SIDS governments and development partners, including the UN system, could support CSOs in delivering and helping to implement and track progress on, on ensuring the achievement of the Abbas over the next um, 10 years. So there's the link. Please, def I encourage you all to review this um, and just you know a bit more about um about the the action plan and roadmap 
so so it's really aligned to the um the four action areas of under the abbas and it recommends actionable priorities to strengthen enabling institutional frameworks practices and partnerships to better support civil society and SIDS to play meaningful and effective roles in delivering sustainable development. Um, and the, the main, I guess, outcomes of this action plan and roadmap will be to mobilize and support collective and individual action by civil society to support the ABAS and other sustainable development priorities in SIDS. Um, it also aims to serve as a guide for governments to develop enabling institutional frameworks and mechanisms which meaningfully support and enable a whole of society approach to delivering sustainable development. And um, it also will serve as a guide for developing development partners um, which can who can provide funding, technical assistance, capacity building, and other support to really help civil society perform these important rules. And um, it could also help to catalyze partnerships within civil society to help achieve the ABAS over the next 10 years. And also, finally, it's important to note that this action plan and roadmap isn't um, prescriptive, but rather it's providing this broad framework, which can be tailored to suit specific contexts, needs, and opportunities and priorities in um, in countries. And also the, you know, monitoring, evaluation, and learning from implementation of the civil society action plan and roadmap should be in line with what is established for the ABAS, um, you know, with the pro process led by for and with civil society. So it's quite important to align the work that the um, IATF is doing in developing the um, the ME framework for the ABAS with with the the ME the MEL for this um, action plan and roadmap for civil society. And I think um a key lesson from the Samoa pathway is the fact that that these things happen early on. And we have, you know, now we have this roadmap, this action plan, and these priorities and um and intentions for um of civil society from from SIDS saying that this is this is the role we want to play, this is how we should be supported, these are some of the partnerships. And you know, civil society has actively come together at the very beginning and saying we are important partners we want to be part of this process and this is our roadmap and action plan and let us work together with governments let us work together with other other CSOs let us work together with uh, development partners to achieve the AVAS together over the next 10 years and I think this is quite um, useful and important and it has that flexibility for um, you know, governments and for NFPs to collaborate and utilize to really harness civil society over the next decade to do so. Um, so definitely looking forward to hearing from from NF NFPs and development partners on how we could really um, start implementing and working with civil society through through you know implementing this action plan and roadmap on the way to achieving the ABAS. So thank you. Thanks, um, Sasha. And I didn't know that there was a roadmap, civil society roadmap. So that's one thing, um, it's good to know that. And maybe in the uh, Q&A, we can delve into how to bring that to life through some of these partnerships that you're referring to. And maybe the panelists may have some ideas on where the points of intersection with your work already with civil society, where we can focus on on, on um, implementation of the roadmap. So uh, with that, um, let me turn to um, Damien uh, from OHR LLS to share some of OHR LLS's perspectives on this issue. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kenora, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just actually want to start with a question uh, to Millie. Uh, have you joined the SIDS Global Business Network? Okay, perfect. This is partnerships in action, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm really glad that the GBN has uh, gotten uh, some references over the previous uh, sessions uh, because that's exactly what I'll be focusing uh, my presentation on. Um, and I'll do that in two, essentially in two steps. 
Uh, firstly, I'll, I'll provide an overview of our work with uh, the SIDS Global Business Network and the biannual forum that we organize. Uh, and then I'll close with uh, some thoughts on how uh, we can work together with uh, NFPs to leverage the business network in support of uh, implementation of the abbots. I'll now just grab the... So the story of the, the, the Global Business Network really began in 2014 with the Private Sector Partnerships Forum and CIS Conference uh, in Samoa. And it was clear during um, the discussions there that the private sector was not only uh, interested in contributing to the CIS agenda, but was eager to, to have a meaningful um, and sustained presence in this conversation. And I, I would say importantly that the SIDS programs of action uh, really can be a, a North Star in terms of guiding uh, private sector engagement um, and, and partnerships with SIDS. And part of the motivation for us has always been to, to get the programs of action uh, onto the lips of the private sector, uh, both internationally and, and local. And so for, for OHRLS, um, that very first forum uh, was instrumental in catalyzing the idea of a network uh, where businesses and uh, entrepreneurs both within SIDS and internationally could gain a seat at the table and, and have a space where the private sector could collaborate uh, with SIDS governments, with international organizations, including the UN, uh, with civil society in a way that was both impactful and aligned with the broader development uh, priorities of SIDS. And so since Samoa, we've, we've held a business forum in each SIDS region, uh, starting in Aruba, where the focus um, was on public-private partnerships, uh, Mauritius, which focused on partnership, partnerships in sustainable tourism, uh, in Palau, um, focusing on ocean-related partnerships, um, and a big thanks to uh, Bridge, uh, because he was really our key partner on the ground to, to organize that forum. Um, and then, of course, most recently at the SIDS4 conference in Antigua and Barbuda, uh, where we focused uh, the discussions on areas including the blue-green economy, uh, financing, uh, digitalization, as well as sustainable tourism. And coming out of the forum in Antigua, we're now working with the private sector um, and other partners to explore how we take forward the recommendations that were made by the private sector uh, in Antigua. Um, and these include uh, the creation of a, a multi-stakeholder initiative for blue-green uh, developments, uh, where we connect local innovators with investors, uh, also securing financing sp uh, for specifically for uh, to support micro, small, and medium enterprises in SIDS. Also developing a roadmap to improve the business environment uh, in SIDS and, and strengthening uh, the relationships between public and private sector. Um, and then also developing a, a new investment framework, uh, including uh, the use of technologies like blockchain and uh, AI. And then we'll now also need to uh, take on Canevius recommendations uh, to create and support uh, business networks at the national level. Um, and I, I just want to say that um, um, we've, we've had a good relationship with uh, Chambers of Commerce uh, in, in various SIDS. Um, we really engaged them in the preparatory process for the Antigua forum. Um, and there was a lot of value there in terms of how they came on board and helped to shape um, the program for, for the forum in Antigua. Uh, so over the years, we've, we've collaborated with um, and, and had participation from global brands right through to small uh, and local enterprises. Um, and this is just really a selection of, of the many of them. Um, and for the 2024 uh, forum in Antigua, uh, we really prioritized and uh, supported the particip participation of small and medium enterprises uh, from SIDS, along with representatives from uh, business support organizations, uh, as well as uh, local cha uh, chambers of commerce. Um, and I just want to say a big thanks to um, our key financial partners as well, uh, Ireland and Denmark, uh, 
uh, who sort of supported us over the years. Um, and, and that relationship has really helped to to make the, the these forums a, a success. The next major part of our efforts is to develop um, and publicize a compendium of the more than 1,300 individuals uh, who are on our on our network's mailing list. Um, this is a big task, um, and, and uh, you know, a, a really kind of a big uh, next major moment for us in terms of the business forum um, and the network itself um, ahead of uh, the 2026 forum. And I'll speak to that in, in a bit uh, later. So our approach has been to um, consistently to seek out companies and organizations who are eager to partner with SIDS uh, to tackle real world challenges on the ground. Um, so there's many examples, but one such example is uh, we've collaborated, for example, with Pali for the Oceans. Um, the top, uh, your top left hand photo is from an event we organized with them uh, at the UN to showcase their program on marine plastics. Um, and you might be wondering why they're holding a shoe. Uh, this is, um, they essentially, they collaborated with uh, Adidas to make footwear uh, from ocean plastic that was collected in the Maldives. Um, and they also have programs uh, now uh, in other cities, including the Dominican Republic, Seychelles, um, and Jamaica. And then the second photo is another example. Uh, this is from a company called Swimsoul, uh, which has intended past fora and, and, and showcased their unique floating solar uh, solutions for islands. Um, and this example actually comes from the Maldives as well. Um, and then just to say that uh, part of our work has also been to produce uh, reports and partnerships. Uh, a couple of examples that you see on the screen are from uh, recent reports on public-private community partnerships uh, in the tourism sector. Uh, and then another report looking at promising sectors within the blue-green uh, economy, uh, cosmetics, uh, e-commerce, and sustainable tourism. Um, and in addition, um, we've held a number of webinars over the years uh, with partners uh, on a host of topics from renewable energy through to, to ecotourism. So what does this mean for, uh, for NFPs? So firstly, uh, you know, we're, we're really keen to work with you to identify and, and compile a compendium of entry points uh, where the private sector, uh, both international and local, uh, can contribute in terms of uh, partnerships on the ground that support uh, implementation of the ABAS. And I think this is where the monitoring and evaluation framework will also be very helpful uh, in, in identifying those entry points uh, specifically for the private sector. Second, um, the business network is a resource that uh, we really encourage NFPs to, to access uh, and tap into um, and, and to enhance you know, your engagement with the, with the private sector. Uh, the network is not just you know, a means to facilitate uh, business deals, um, but is also a platform uh, for knowledge exchange, for capacity building, uh, and potentially also for technical cooperation. Uh, so for, interest, uh, for instance, if you're interested to leverage uh, innovative technologies, such as the floating solar uh, panels that I mentioned earlier, you know, we'd be happy to, to make the connections uh, with companies like Swim, uh, SwimSoul and others. Uh, and then third, I mentioned webinars earlier. Um, you know, we really look forward to, to having you join those. Um, our next webinar, by the way, just to plug an event as well, uh, on the 6th of November, uh, this will be discussing actually the recommendations that came out of the, the private sector uh, forum in Antigua and how we're going to work together with uh, private sector uh, and other actors to, to take those forward. Um, and we'll be sure actually to share the details with the NFP network. And then just say um, the next business forum will be in uh, 2026 in the Atlantic, Indian Ocean, and South China Sea region. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're moving around the regions. Um, and we would be interested to also collaborate uh, ahead of, with, with NFPs ahead of that, uh, that forum to ensure that we ha you help us to shape the focus of that forum so that it aligns with your, your national uh, priorities as well. Um, and we would also encourage uh, the participation of NFPs or relevant counterparts uh, from your countries to, to 
take part and connect with companies uh, that are eager to uh, do business and partner with SIDS. And then finally, uh, we also heard from Garth's uh, presentation about the SIDS Center of Excellence, uh, which will include an island investment forum. Um, and this is something that we really look forward to, to working with Antigua and Barbuda um, to, to ensure that um, the business network and the forum uh, complements um, the island investment forum uh, and that we're all sort of aligned for, for maximum impact. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Damien, and I think um, the one one thing to discuss certainly is, given the small size of the private sector in SIDS, how do we ensure that we coordinate several initiatives aimed at the private sector in SIDS? And I say that um, with the recommendation from Kennedy in mind, uh, noting that there's the Global Compact and there is and there are several other initiatives um aiming at a private sector so that's something i think definitely we need to think about in terms of partnership how do we link up all these different initiatives so that we can ensure that um we really um leverage as much of the capacity of the local private sector as possible um in in sits um we're so supposed to have a, a bit of an interactive session now, but I, I'm thinking in the interest of time because I know that the, according to the program, unless the organizers tell me differently, at 4 p.m. we're supposed to be starting the wrap up, but I wanted to take the two uh, discussions and then open up for uh, questions and, and comments from the NFPs and other colleagues that are here. Um, so maybe first we take, um, our colleague from the um, PIF, the Secretariat, um, Vilami, and then after uh, Miss Kalina Tapa from uh, Tuvalu. So first, um, you have the floor, sir. Uh, thank you, moderator. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll try to be as quick as possible. So for the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, we have a number of mechanisms and strategies that we employ to engage our various partners within the region, within the region and beyond. Um, and I just uh, highlighted a few here. Uh, and just beginning with our non-state actor strategy, which really looks at our engagement with private sector and civil society. Um, with the private sector, it's really around de the development of our regional uh, private sector strategy, uh, which will develop priorities and strategies to fast track effort on post COVID uh, economic recovery, as well as outline priority areas to boost the private sector within the region. Uh, in addition to that, also harmonize uh, with the vision of the 2050 strategy as well and advance the thematic area on resource and economic development within the 2050 strategy. Uh, we also have a few other initiatives uh, with private sector, including the launch of the e-commerce grant facility, uh, which aims to support 30 selected uh, MSMEs to strengthen e-commerce uh, opportunities for enhancing trade opportunities between the Pacific and Korea. Uh, we also have the economic recovery project in the Pacific Island countries, uh, and this was a uh, uh, partnership through through Japan um, with a grant provided of uh, US 1.7 million to stimulate trade, investment, and tourism opportunities between Japan and 16 of our forum island countries. Um, and then in, the, in addition to that, uh, the strategy, we also coordinate the leaders dialogue between our private sector and civil society, where our private sectors and civil society from the various uh, countries are able to elevate issues uh, up to the, uh, the leaders platform. But beyond that, we also use the our non-state engagement to really involve our, our civil society and private sector people in the policy development, uh, which concerns them. Um, the second part, 
that uh, is around our forum dialogue partners. Uh, and these are countries that strategically engage with the Pacific Islands uh, and contribute to discussions and initiatives aimed at regional development and security. Uh, so through the forum dialogue partner mechanism, uh, we facilitate uh, engagement with countries outside of the region uh, and look at strategic uh, cooperation, engagement, and political and uh, economic development within the Pacific. Uh, we also work with uh, our forum dialogue partners to build understanding, support, and action on the forum leaders' vision and the regional priorities. We currently have 21 forum dialogue partners, uh, and five of which is our founding members, which include Canada, France, Japan, United Kingdom, and the US. Um, the third uh, level of engagement is with our, something you would have heard of during the week, uh, the CROP agencies, which is the Council of Regional Organizations in the Pacific. Um, and we currently have nine crop agencies that uh, sort of are mandated to look after various sectors within the, uh, the region. These include the Forum Fisheries Agency, uh, the Pacific Asia uh, Aviation Safety Office, the Pacific Power Association, Pacific Islands Development Program, uh, the Pacific Community, SPC, uh, the Secretariat for the Pacific Regional Environment Program, or SPREP, uh, the University of the South Pacific, and the Pacific Tourism Organization. So these organizations uh, really uh, have their mandated areas that they look after, and we partner with uh, these organizations to re look at uh, various pol policy areas that we elevate up to leaders. Um, the fourth uh, level of engagement and partnership is our forum observers, which include the UN. And I just wanted to highlight here uh, the CROP and UN country teams, principles for dialogue and engagement, which we recently signed uh, earlier this year. Uh, so CROP agencies and the United Nations country teams have established the CROP UNCT Pacific Principles for Dialogue and Engagement to enhance partnership and collaboration for the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 2050 Strategy. Uh, following the first CROP UN Dialogue uh, held in the margins of the 52nd PIF Leaders Meeting in Fiji, a draft principles were developed to support and, and enhance coordination and collaboration in its implementation effort. Uh, these principles were officially endorsed and signed in uh, on 18th of April, 2024. So <clears throat> the principles include mutual, mutual accountability and respect, which emphasizes open, honest relationship and partnership based on shared norms and values, regional cooperation, recognizing the importance of coordinated regional architecture inclusive of the Pacific Islands, inclusive approach, advocating for a human rights-based and sustainable approach with active participation from member states, crop agencies, UN agencies, and uh, our diverse non-state actors. Public goods and development, focusing on health, education, gender empowerment, social protection, inter-regional uh, trade, climate chair resilience and others, collaboration and coordination, enhancing joint programs, resource mobilization, technical assistance, and sustainable development leadership. Uh, the initial priorities to strengthen this collaboration, sorry, I'll just uh, highlight these uh, around building uh, mutual understanding, uh, which include uh, crop and UN agency open days and joint events de and developing advocacy packages and joint communication, uh, mapping existing co coordination mechanism and collecting case studies. Uh, we also have joint planning and resource mobilization, 
uh, and strengthening joint reporting. So those are just some of the key areas uh, around this, uh, the principles that have been prioritized. Uh, so just thank you, Matri. Okay, um, hello for everyone. Um, my name is Kelena and I am the NFP for uh, Tuvalu. Um, first, I would like to thank the government of Vanuatu for hosting us and uh, for warm hospitality and also uh, UNOHRLS for sponsoring us to be able to attend the, um, the state NFP meeting. Um, also thank our panel of speakers for sharing your meaningful um, insight on strengthening um, the NFP partnerships. I would like to reflect um, and share how I, as an NFP, will work across with the line ministry on the implementation of the APAS. Well, I would like to share um, that in 2022, uh, my department undergone um, a restructured reform where the cabinet um, has approved uh, the reinstatement of the m and &E function under the Department of Planning, Budget, and Aid Coordination. So we now consist of uh, four division, which has a distinctive dimension that um, together establishes the um, coherent stru structure and build um, a strong relationship um, with the line ministry, local governments, and the civil society. Um, the benefits of uh, this restructure reform primarily um, improve the quality of advice to our, lead our leaders, um, greater understanding of issues within the ministry, um, a holistic view of ministry, the removal of silos, greater opportunity to provide um, input into ministry uh, policy development activities, and more res um, responsive to emerging issues. So as an NFP, I am interested um, to raise um, the awareness among my team members on the ABAS and to work on, on a mapping exercise of the ABAS in alignment to our national um, strategy for sustainable development uh, priorities. From there, I am confident that my team is well positioned um, by reaching out to and provide awareness to their allocated uh, sectors and ministries on the ABAS and to integrate as part of their annual work plan uh, going forward. Um, ABAS is a 10-year agenda. So by looking at the key areas of uh, the ABAS, I confirmed that there are a um, number of our development uh, projects which are uh, supported by our partners are uh, currently in progress on its feasible implementation. Um, this includes the Tuvalu Coastal uh, Adaptation Project, um, this project uh, basically focused on the land rec reclamation and raised lands, which is um, an initiative that aims um, to scale up our climate resilience coastal protection efforts to combat um, climate change. Um, we also have the submarine cable project, which has a capital cost of uh, 42 million. Um, this is supported by uh, World Bank uh, um, which contribute in achieving our national uh, strategic um, priority one of enabling environments and achieving our national outcome one in harnessing the digital uh, trans transformation to improve lives. It is where we aim to develop an um, inclusive uh, digital economy by fostering virtual activities such as e-commerce, um, e-learning, e-government, telemedicine. And we also have a floating uh, solar panel project on our effort to achieve a renewable um, energy supply. So it is important to clearly identify and outline um, of which of the areas in the past can be achieved over a short term, medium term, and long term. Um, the successful implementation of this uh, requires uh, both financial and technical support from our bilateral, uh, regional, and multilateral partners. So I believe that each um, seat uh, country have their own development cooperation uh, processes. So for us in Tuvalu, we held a donut 
roundtable meeting once in every two years. So this is the high level dialogue between the government and our development partners on issues such as the progress against um, our national plan in terms of uh, delivery against the milestones, achievement of outcomes and evaluation of uh, the key sector uh, strategies and priorities for the government and the ODA uh, going forward. Um, <clears throat> this forum also discusses resource um, estimation as well progress uh, against coordination uh, strategies and the effectiveness of uh, these strategies. Uh, just to conclude, I look forward for the ongoing uh, partnership of multiple stakeholders at the national, regional, and international level for the successful uh, implementation of uh, this ag um, agenda. And also looking forward once the m and &E, uh, framework of the Abbas is complete by uh, mid next year and able to uh, share to us the seed countries. Thank you. Tafa, and um, just one final intervention, and then we can open up the floor for um, uh, interaction with the panel. Um, I'd like to invite the Secretary General for the Vango, that's the um, Van Vanuatu NGO Association, to just make a quick uh, two minutes intervention. Um, so thank you very much, moderator, and thank you for the organizers to invite Vango to be part of this meeting. Um, firstly, in terms of uh, partnership, I would like to acknowledge and recognize the progress, especially here in Vanuatu, um, for Vango to be engaged in um, various activities, especially when it comes to the VNR. Vango was part of the steering committee in 2019 and also 2024, where we were part of uh, the steering committee for prepar preparing the um, national statement. We also, I also comment the uh, Vanuatu government, especially recently uh, this year, so representatives are appointed to key national thematic committee committees, which is uh, a good step, especially towards uh, partnership. Um, for Vango internally, um, we would like to empower CSOs to be at the forefront of development efforts, uh, whether humanitarian or advocating for the critical issues that affect their communities or even apply for small grants. Um, in saying that, we have launched the CSO map recently, and we are working now on a NGO directory, which should be complete by, completed by the... Um, early next year. This is just to ensure that civil society are working in alignment with the NSDB as well as the visibility of the work in country and also um, the coordination, especially uh, the, the coordination, coordination efforts um, in the country. Um, in saying that, I would like to maybe highlight some areas of which as a civil society for, you know, for this meeting, for the purpose of meeting is we would like to, you know, see the formalization of NGO engagement, and this is to like, you know, establish formal partnership uh, with NGOs, especially through like annual monitoring or progress reports, the NGO should be part of this uh, a group that could, uh, you know, monitor the development progress. Um, also within the ABAS framework, we would like to see, you know, indicators that could um, help uh, monitor the, the progress of, you know, how CSO or uh, private sector have been, you know, working with the government or especially the enabling environment where we can actively do our work uh, within the civil society or, or private sector. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Abrams. Um, now, um, colleagues, we have about 20 minutes and I think it's an opportunity for us to have an interactive discussion. They are there are some, um, we have 20 minutes, yeah? Yeah, we were supposed to have a coffee break <laughs> um, 10 minutes ago, I think. So if you want to grab your coffee and come back so we can have a working uh, coffee break, I think that might be the best thing to do at this point. So if you want to step out and come back, but I... I also wanted to um, invite any questions from uh, colleagues in the room to the panelists. Um, 
I have a few questions myself, but um, let me see first if there are other questions that uh, you would like to ask. Ambassador, yes. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. And uh, let me also thank our uh, presenters for their um, presentation. Just uh, basically three things. One is the partnership issue. I think we all agree that that is central uh, in terms of implementation. And I think when we look at the Samoa uh, pathway, we spoke about genuine and durable partnership. I think under the Abbas, I think the thinking has changed a little bit. We're now talking about sustainable partnership. And what that means is, as I said uh, during my presentation yesterday, is that we as SITS need to bring something to the table to make the partnership sustainable. And I think that that is critical in terms of the implementation that we're looking at. So I just want to raise that point, put it on the table in terms of the engagement of our national focal points, because I think it's something that we should continue to think about. So that's the, the, the first uh, issue. The second one relates to uh, civil society engagement. I think there is no doubt that all of us see the role of civil society in the implementation process. But I think what we also need to consider is how that input comes into the decision-making process in member countries. Um, it's not to not appreciate and recognize the valuable contribution of civil society and other stakeholders but I think at the end of the day, we have to accept that government are accountable. Civil society, and I don't like saying this, but it is a fact, they are not accountable to anyone except themselves. So when you look at government, when they make decisions and they're wrong, they're accountable to the people. That is the, the difference. So I think we also need to see how those input from civil society and other stakeholders can be integrated and inputted in the decision-making process. Um, and finally, this uh, discussion in terms of uh, private sector engagement, I think somebody was referring to the fact that in some of our region, especially in the Pacific, for example, we're too small. Uh, you know, it's in some countries like uh, Tuvalu, for example, it's non-existent basically. It's very, very small. So that makes scale a bit of a big challenge. And I wonder, therefore, uh, perhaps uh, just to put it on the table as well, whether in the cases of regions, uh, perhaps with a very small private sector, that a regional approach might be uh, more feasible rather than uh, perhaps going at it alone. So again, I'm just sort of putting those on the table uh, for consideration and perhaps comments uh, from uh, the panel, if they wish. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, um, Ambassador. I think all very important points. And um, yes, yeah, certainly I think the, the whole economies of scale discussion and taking the regional approach to private sector is important. 
I think this has come up several times um, today and, and yesterday. Um, and yeah, being mindful that there are many other players um, engaging and courting the private sector on many issues, um, as as was noted before. So we need to think about that. But let me let me um, invite maybe one other comment from um, the NFPs and then turn to the panelists so that they can respond to as many of the questions as possible. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it's a very interesting discussion. Um, I would like to build upon what the ambassador just said, because my question is relatively similar. Um, so I have a question regarding the implementation of public and private partnerships. Um, I was wondering if there are any examples of checks and balances or other kinds of processes that can ensure that implementation is geared towards the actual resolution of issues um, and not the creation of profit. So perhaps to put another way, you know, how do we ensure that the private sector is not infringing upon the role of government um, as we advance in these partnerships? Thank you. Thank you for that. That's a very interesting question. <laughs> um, I would like to turn to the panelists. Maybe we start with you, Millie, in terms of the private sector, the checks and balances. How do we ensure that government enables the private sector, but at the same time, the private sector is good corporate citizen in terms of how they contribute and um, support the development outcomes? Thank you for that. Those are very good questions. Um, I would say because we aren't many in terms of population, uh, many of the private sector players are actually really embedded in the community, at least those that have been here for a long time. Uh, so if you're inviting international private sector, then they might be international or regional. But, you know, after a while, if you stay in the, if you stay, if you are able to be solvent, in a sits nation, you know, you are there possibly for a lifestyle, but that is just an observation. Um, in terms of my answer to that is um, a very practical answer is that you need to give the private sector profit because if not, they cannot uh, plan for the future. They cannot compete in terms of the innovation. So you have to trust your private sector partner because within their um, ecosystem, it's uh, quite harsh as well. So we are on the same boat in terms of size, scale, supply chain issue. So I would say um, for the beginning, uh, maybe at the beginning of a particular partnership, um, you know, clear it, write it down on the contract. Uh, but if you just say you cannot be so profitable then you will not be able to attract possibly the best innovators because the innovators themselves have to be really supported and incubated. And also because of our extreme climate, no one is immune, no private sector player within the region is immune to loss and uh, catastrophic loss in terms of infrastructure. And uh, what we want is we want meaningful partnership such that we could solve really big infrastructure problems, uh, be it digital infrastructure, be it water, be it energy, and you need profit to be able to attract that kind of uh, liaison because those private sector players also have to partner with other regional players or other international players as well. Thank you, Millie. And um, Ambassador posed the question on how, what do we need to do differently to make these partnerships sustainable and to scale them, uh, which is, I think, at the heart of the of the ABAS and the, and the sort of um, progress that has been made uh, between these pathways that spoke about durable partnerships to now more sustainable. So I was wondering if... Um, or uh, the UK and, and Malta, if you have some some thoughts on, on that question. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think part, um, so I just want to go back, which is kind of a relevant point. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with profit, right? So if, for these um, partnerships to be sustainable, they have to benefit all the parties that are involved. And so when it comes to the private sector, they're about making profit, that's what they do. So of course we don't expect executives in London to drive around in Rolls Royces on the back of 
Vanuatu villages or, or whatever, but I think um, profit is important. And we already work in partnership with private sector on a lot of development programming. We have consultant companies that design programs for us um, and so on. And they do it because they make money from doing it, but it suits us as well because they have expertise and we need people who have expertise to make the programs effective. So, um, so um, these partnerships which benefit all the parties then will be the most durable um, partnerships. I just want to make a reflection on the on the role of civil society. I mean, it, it's true in the end, governments are accountable and, and take decisions and um, politicians are elected and represent people and they have to sort of take the decisions. But um, we are democratic countries. And so uh, having the input of all parts of society is very, very important. So I think this consultation and input we get from all different parts of society is really crucial to make sure that we're coming up with um, with proper solutions that are effective and meet the needs of societies. So I really value the participation of, um, of Van Gogh and it's very important. Um, I think that at all our meetings and big meetings around this is agenda, there's always a vibrant participation from civil society representing different constituencies. I think it's very important. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I want to latch on to, to a bit what Rebecca was saying, but also to the question um, regarding how to ensure that you don't have profit at the expense of. And although, and I do fully understand also the point made by, by Millie, which makes a lot of sense, I think the answer is also though to have checks and balances in the form of monitoring and evaluation, really. It's having that process embedded within government structures that make it make um that in it's it's I mean it sounds simple, it's definitely not as I'm sure also um the colleague from Vanuatu can very well attest. Having but those sort of principles embedded within within the system, but also ensuring that the private sector can work so it, it's not too cumbersome, so as to you know, to kind of have a stifling environment, but at the same time ensure that the government is also getting the buck for his money, really, really and truly. So it's a bit of that. As to Ambassador Lutero's um, question about genuine, you know, kind of the evolution from genuine and durable partnerships into sustainable partnerships, I would say there is one, probably um, one feel rouge, one red line tying all of that up, and that would be having the buy-in of all stakeholders. Without that, nothing's going to work. It's, it's as simple as that. Who's who's championing it? Who has an interest for it to work? If it is all parties, then there is a more of a chance that those stay, those partnerships will actually stay on and be renewed and perhaps added on and more funds are given. I mean, especially uh, I think most of us in this room work within government systems and we know how it works. You usually get a small pot of money if it works and if the government sees that there is value, then there is more interest to have it, to have more added to it and having stakeholders putting in also their own uh, part of the budget. So it's also working within a system, not working in silos. I think this is the one thing that I feel we've learned as Malta. The less we work as silos, the more, the bigger the chances are that partnerships actually work and linger on Thank you uh, for those experiences. And I actually just wanted to say on the issue of the civil society engagement that we have seen, um, certainly as the UN across the world, many models of um, civil society organizations delivering services on behalf of governments and therefore being part of that shared accountability um, for for results. Uh, so, and, and also, creating mechanisms um, in the context of the SDGs, for example, we've seen many governments look into different models for bringing civil society to the table so that you can get those perspectives. And I think as um, Rebecca was saying, ensuring that the voices that are not necessarily in the decision-making process, that those voices can, can surface. So I think it would be interesting to think about what some of those models can look like um, as we think about the ABAS implementation so that you respect the role of government and the, and the mandate given to governments, but also find a way 
to bring in a multi-stakeholder perspective into the into the implementation of the of the others. But I'm sure um, my other colleagues have some quick reactions. Sure, no problem. And um, you know, I think it's the Ambassador Lutero, you raised an important point on accountability because it, accountability goes both ways government and civil society and in the civil society action plan and roadmap um you know the SID civil society actually there's a section on on actions to better enable and support civil society's role in sustainable development and um one of one of the enabling actions is you know government supporting strengthening of laws and regulations to better support nonprofit sector um to deliver on these actions um including you know having more enabling um legislation and regulation for registration procedures that are simpler um and are fit for purpose for for SIDS, um, because you know a lot of of our um, civil society and community based organizations are not registered because it's so difficult um, for these small organizations to go through that process to be able to access or be able to get a bank account to have these sort of um, of accounting requirements um, to to be able to access funding. So you know. These are some of the um the enabling actions that civil society in the region have put forward to to governments to help strengthen um their accountability by putting in place these sorts of of legislation and regulations to enable them to better um deliver. Um, in addition, some of the other actions have been to to um also set standards. To define what the role of civil society will be in um, legislative processes and decision making, for example, so it could be creating a formal space for civil society to engage on um, in 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 any sort of decision making, if it's national policy making, um, legislative processes on on um, any sort of sustainable development priorities, and also creating a, a framework for periodic formal consultation with civil society on national policies across all sectors. So these are some of the examples um, that that could help ensure that civil society is accountable um, to government and to their the, the public and their beneficiaries as well. Um, and also in terms of data collection and that support for for this it's you know we we've been speaking about the need for capacity building for NFPs, but also noting that civil society does a lot you know already collects data and analyzes data for the specific work that they're doing. If it's on you know poverty reduction, or if it's on climate change education and awareness, or um, water and sanitation. But what we need to do, and we've they recognized this, is capacity building on, you know, data collection methods, on on data processing and analyze, uh, you know, analysis that would be suitable um, for NFPs, for UN organizations to actually utilize the data that they've been collecting all the time. So capacity building to support NGOs to improve the quality of of the the data. That they've been collecting and analyzing already so you know now that data can be utilized and it is it's part of that accountability mechanism so these are some of the um some of the enabling actions put forward by civil society organizations in the action plan and roadmap so i definitely encourage all nfps and so on to please read this and see how you could utilize and harness some of the um the the recommendations put forward um by civil society um in in SIDS moving to see how we could move forward with implementing the Avas together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um Demian, I don't know if you want to weigh in on the checks and balances question. I actually wanted to come in on something else. Em. <laughs> Um, no, I just wanted to add um, uh, just a, some additional reflections on sort of the, the potential partners and stakeholders that we really need to engage to to localize the address. 
Um, Creator referred to youth yesterday and the important role that they play. Um, you know, SIDS have really strong, articulate uh, uh, climate activists, for example, youth climate activists. Um, and we need, uh, likewise, uh, youth abbas activists. Um, I think education, the education sector really has a role to play. Um, and how do we get the abbas into national curricula, uh, the secondary level, tertiary level, for example, um, and, and getting ministries of, of, of education involved? Uh, the media has an important role to play as well. Um, how do we ensure that you know your your national TV programs and your radio programs are talking about the issues that are in the abyss uh, beyond the SIDS conference that happens every ten years, and where, where they're sort of focused on it. Um, and and then of course um, uh, uh, you know partnerships to support uh, the very people who are going to be doing the monitoring and evaluating on the ground, the, the national focal points. Um, who are the stakeholders, who are the partners that we need to get around the table to, to support uh, that effort. Um, we, we know and we've heard from national focal points over the years that um, they wear multiple hats on the ground. Uh, they're covering the SDGs, they're covering the SIDS agenda, they're covering Sendai, they're covering Paris, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and capac their capacity to, to handle all of this um, is, is, is very limited. Um, and then just finally, um, you know, uh, how do we get ensure that the government ministries are also, you know, sort of taking a collective effort um, and, and sort of breaking out of silos? You know, you know, the abbas might might uh, sit within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Ministry of Planning, for example, and that's where that sort of the, the focus is. Um, but how do we ensure that we break down silos uh, across ministries and really get everybody on board? Um, so yeah, just some additional uh, reflections as well. And I think in that uh, spirit, there was also the comment on SID SIDS, strengthening SID SIDS partnership. Um, I think this came up repeatedly, and I think we haven't um, done justice as yet to thinking through what that looks like and what are the sort of frameworks. Of course, we know we have AOSIS and we have various mechanisms um, for SID SIDS experiences and to strategize and harmonize in terms of their approach to many of the issues that we've been talking about, but in terms of practical SIDS, SIDS whether it's in the area of, um, you know, private sector, public, public private partnerships, how to do public private partnerships, what work in, what works in the SIDS context, I think is still something that ha um, we need to look at and maybe through the national focal points, this can be an area where there could be some further discussion in terms of how do you strengthen that framework for, for identifying good practices from SIDS that can be implemented by other SIDS um, uh, to, to, to ensure that the ABAS is, is finally implemented. And I don't want to lose the comment from Juliet um, that uh, came out in her intervention and she spoke about there is a need um, for building capacity of national focal points to precisely navigate and determine what are the kind of appropriateships that are necessary um, for the implementation of the ABAS. Um, I think you were referring to partnership strategies and building partnership strategies around the ABAS that are very specific, that are very detailed so that those um, you know, different players can be engaged in the process of engaging the Abbas. I know Ambassador, you wanted to come in, um, final word, and then we wrap the session. Thank you very much. No, I, I want to make a, a point very clear. Um, in response to Rebecca um, and other colleagues, what I was referring to, um, was not the actor's engagement. It was more the principles. For example, it's member states that engage with partners in terms of funding. So the commitment and the accountability is with governments. The actors of implementation includes civil society. So that is where I was going, you know, that we need to recognize that, you know. I was not sort of saying that 
the engagement of civil society is not important. I, I thought that I made that point very clear. But when you engage with partners, IFIs, MDPs, for example, it's government that, that negotiate. And therefore, they are accountable for the resources. But when you come to the engagement of actors to implement, that is not a problem. I'm not saying that civil society should not be involved. So I, I just want to make that point very clear so that there is no misunderstanding in terms of my comments and where I was going. Thank you. Th thank you very much, um, Ambassador, for that point. And I think well understood. Um, let me um, end by just thanking the panelists uh, and the participants for their really valuable insights and their contributions. I think um, this is a session that perhaps we could have given a lot more time to um, because I feel as though we've just started to scratch the surface of this conversation. Um, but definitely it sounds to me and it seems to me it's something that the NFPs could certainly be picking up um, when they think of once the m and &E framework is in place, which is another important element in this, um, they could be thinking about what are the partnerships to deliver on the results that have been presented under the m and &E framework for, for the ABAS. Um, it goes without saying that um, I think everyone agrees that partnerships are crucial um, for, for implementation. I started by saying that it's also a way of um, bringing in the means for implementation that we know many SIDS um, still need to acquire to deliver on an agenda as ambitious as the as the ABAS. So thinking about partnerships around data, partnerships around financing, partnerships around technology, partnerships around institutional development and capacities, and that came out in many of the interventions, I think would be crucial um, in terms of identifying concrete um, steps uh, forward. So with that, um, thank you very much. We went over time, but um, I'll hand over to OHI LLS. No. No. Um, thank you very much. That was that was very rich discussions. And I think uh, just when we were starting to get into the heat of things, then we have to close at some point. So uh, now what I'll what we'll do now is we'll 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 break for a very quick five five minutes. Um, grab your coffee.